about uh, being in God's place of authority where He wants you to be. Only where He wants you to be. Oh my. We used to talk about uh, He's a mission volunteer. I want to tell you something. God doesn't look for volunteers. He wants those whom He has called to be there. I mean, if you volunteer for something, you might be a little bit misplaced in it. Maybe your intentions are good, but God has an appointed place where He wants you, nobody else. I want to share a story with you that illustrates that that truth very, very clearly. Now, <clears throat> let's go back to the Old Testament, the days of the tabernacle. And you remember there was uh, something called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, that thing wasn't empty. You know, there were some articles in that Ark. You remember there were three things. By the way, the, the Ark, of course, represents the presence of God with His people. And having been sealed by the Holy Spirit born again we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and we can choose if we want to to live in the barren wilderness instead of enjoying the riches of Canaan but we don't have to do that all right in that that ark there were three things first there was the manna now I said the ark represents the presence of God with his people. The manna represents his presence, God's presence and his provision. In that ark there were the tablets, the tables of the law. Of course representing God's righteousness and his law. But there was a third thing and that's what I want to focus on. Do you remember the third thing that was in that ark? It was Aaron's rod that budded. Aaron's staff speaks of the authority of God and the power of God that is to be evident in every true believer. Now, to discover what this is all about, we have to go back to an incident that's described in the book of Numbers. In Numbers chapter 16 and 17, you might remember that there was an uprising, a rebellion taking place against Moses and Aaron. It involved 250 very influential men. We're told that they were well known in the community of Israel. And they were members of the council. These were leaders. Okay? And, and they had assumed places of leadership. And they had certain authority. And they came as a group and deposed Moses and Aaron. And here's their complaint. You can read it in Numbers chapter 16 verse 3. They said, you've gone too far. Look, the whole community is holy. We're all the people of God. Every one of the, these people. And the Lord is with them. Why do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? That was their complaint. Now here's what they're saying. Who do you think you are? Who gives you the right to set yourself up as leaders and to tell us what to do and how to behave? These people are holy enough. Get off their backs, leave them alone. On what grounds do you assume the right to lead us? Well, I suppose on the surface that's a perfectly legitimate, reasonable question to ask. So I'll ask you, paraphrasing 
their question. On what grounds or what what grounds does anybody have the right to assume leadership among the people of God? How do you receive the authority to lead and expect others to cooperate with you? Is that a fair question? Who gives you the right? How do you have the right to exercise leadership? Where did you get your authority? Okay, that was the complaint against Moses and Aaron. These people said, look, we've got as much ability as you've got. We know as much as you do. And we're just as holy as you are. So, why do you have this right? All right, the ringleader of this group was a man by the name of Korah. Now, it's significant that Korah was a Levite. The Levites were already given privileged position because we read in uh, verse 9 of number 16, the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the Israelite community and brought you near himself to do the work at the Lord's tabernacle and to stand before the community and minister, and minister to them. Now, it's true that every priest was to be a Levite, although not every Levite was a priest. So far, only Aaron, the brother of Moses, had been given the position as priest. So here was Korah's problem. Here was this, this man. His problem was that in not being content with the role that God had already given him as a Levite, he was demanding the particular privilege and responsibility of the priesthood also. All right, let me rephrase that. Here was this man who had already been given a place of responsibility. God had set aside the Levites as special ministers in the community. However, he was not content. He wanted additional privilege and responsibility. Now, Moses' diagnosis of this this. Uh, situation is interesting listen to what Moses said number 16 11 it is against the Lord that you and all your followers have banded together who is Aaron that you should grumble against him in other words the rebellion is not against Aaron it's not against Moses it's against God I want to, I'll say it again that listen when you complain about your station your appointed place moan and groan and complain it's not against the pastor it's against God now if somebody wants to attack God what does he do now you can't literally attack God because God's invisible and there is nothing to hit. So I'll tell you what people will do when they want to attack God. They'll attack His people. And they'll turn their attention to those who, who are known as God's men and women. In other words, they will attack those who represent God and who exercise the authority of God. Now if God has given you some position, if God has given you some influence, some ministry, and if you seek to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and to walk humbly with Him, don't be surprised if you come under attack. Be surprised if you don't come under attack. Because... The Apostle Paul said to young Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.12, Everyone 
who seeks to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And that's not because a godly life is despicable, because the reverse is true. But it's because godliness is a tangible expression of God. If somebody wants to hurt God, then that somebody must attack that which expresses God. So the persecution of the church all through its history has been the persecution of Christ. Uh, you remember when Saul of Tarsus was on the way to Damascus? He was there to search out disciples of Jesus, followers of Christ. He was going to imprison them. He was an arch persecutor of the church. And you remember the risen Lord appeared to him and asked him a question. He did not say, Saul, what have you got against my people? Saul, why are you persecuting my people? What did he say? Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, Paul, Saul had no intention of persecuting Jesus. As far as he was concerned, Jesus was dead, gone. But in persecuting the people of Christ, who are the expression of Christ... He was persecuting Christ himself. Paul was flabbergasted, breathing out murderous thoughts against the Lord's disciples. And how could he attack Christ? He didn't even know who Christ was. Very simply, by attacking the church, which is the body of Christ, he was attacking Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is incarnate in the world, in the body his Father gave him on the day of Pentecost. The body consists of those who have entered into a relationship with him. He is the head and his spirit is the life and we are the individual members that comprise the body. So an attack on the body is an attack on Christ. And the reason why there might be an attack on the body is not that there is a conflict with the church, but a conflict with Christ himself. And that's what Moses is saying to these people. He said, your problem is not with me. It's not with Aaron. Your problem is with God. You're rebelling against God. Do you remember that God had to reassure Samuel of this? The people rebelled. You remember that they demanded a king just like all those nations around them. Saul was their leader. He was depressed. He was hurt. He was insulted. <laughs> and listen to what God said to him. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. He said, It's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. In other words, Samuel, don't take this personally. You inevitably take the brunt of their rebellion for you are their physical target but the people don't have a controversy with you their problem is with me now I don't want to ne negate legitimate criticism I mean even leaders are subject to correction and a leader who is not responsible to correction is not the kind of leader you want. Leaders are subject to correction. And we must always take our critics seriously in the sense that we must consider that they may, might be right. And if they are, we ought to listen to them and be thankful to the for them. And then in humility, we do whatever is necessary to make correction. However, there will be that criticism, that opposition that is directed against God and it's a fundamental expression of rebellion against Him and that's how we treat it. Okay, let's notice what happened then. Here they are in rebellion, not against Moses and Aaron, but against the Lord. Without going into details, we see that God brought a severe judgment upon them, the leaders of this rebellion. All the ringleaders, 
all of them perished in an earthquake that swallowed them up, buried them alive, and their cohorts were destroyed. In verse 35, number 16, fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men. Now, amazingly, amazingly, the whole nation then grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Number 1641, you've killed the Lord's people. Moses and Aaron couldn't win. Either way, they win. The people at first accused them of taking responsibilities that many others would have been equally qualified to do, they thought. And now that God has expressed himself in such dramatic judgment upon the rebellion, those who remain accuse them of being responsible for that destruction. Well, God says, I'm going to put an end to this. This continued rebellion, he sends another round of judgment against the people. You remember, this time it was a plague. Moses sent Aaron to intercede on behalf of the people to prevent it. And God said, number 16, verses 46 through 49, take your censer and put incense in it along with fire from the altar and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague in addition to those who died because of Korah. Number 16, 46 through 49. This is a horrific story of rebellion and judgment followed by more rebellion and more judgment. It's the issue is this, and this is what I want to talk to you about. The issue is that of knowing whom God has called to lead and to perform particular functions in accordance with his will. This is not to question how dedicated you are. It's not to question how devoted you are, how zealous you are. It, the issue is simply this. Whom has God called and appointed to do particular functions? So how do we know that God has called someone to a task? Do we simply take a person's word for it? That's, that's what Korah and the others were asking. On what grounds do you assume this? Are we just to take your word for it? So, is there some test that we can apply? All right? Let's notice the evidence of God's calling. <clears throat> we talk about authority. I don't want to follow somebody that doesn't have the authority of God. I mean, no telling where he might lead me. But so what's the evidence? This is where Aaron's staff comes into the picture. Because God says, I'm going to demonstrate once for all whom I have called to the priesthood. He said in number 17, 5, I'm going to get rid of this constant grumbling against you by the Israelites. All right, here's the test. God told Moses to get 12 sticks, 12 staffs. Now remember, the staff is a sign of authority and power. Get 12 staffs, one that represents each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now on each staff, Moses, you, you carve out the name of the person to whom it belongs. You got the picture now? We got 12 rods from one from each tribe carved on each rod was the name of the person the leader to whom it belonged okay representing the tribe of Levi was the staff of Aaron now the staff wasn't just a walking stick carried for convenience it represented the authority the status the ministry of that tribe. That was always its meaning. Go back to the time of Jacob. Remember in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, 
Jacob was blessing his sons before he died. Okay, it was Judah's turn. And here's what we read. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. A messianic statement, of course, referring to Jesus Christ. So the staff of Judah, the ruler's staff, would come into the hands of the Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So here's the whole issue at stake in, in this, this time uh, uh, of the rebellion. The people had been saying, we can do this job just as well as Moses and Aaron. And maybe they could have. I, I think there were probably a lot of capable people out there. Uh, they had the knowledge. They had the zeal. They had the dedication. They said, we can do the job just as well as Moses and, and Aaron. And the object of the exercise was to show whom God had chosen and to give the evidence of his choice. Okay. Moses took all 12 of these staffs into the tabernacle. He placed those rods in the most holy place before the Ark of the Covenant. Only the priest was eligible to enter the most holy place. So he, uh, he took the staffs in there, sent the owners home, and the staffs were left overnight before the Lord. All right, you got the picture now? Here's the tabernacle. Here's the holy place. Twelve rods, twelve sticks were in there overnight. They were there. The next day, verse 8, number 17, Moses entered the tent of the testimony. And he saw a strange thing. All 12 sticks were still there, but one staff was different. Something happened. He saw that Aaron's staff, which represented the house of Levi, had not only sprouted, it had budded, it had blossomed, and it had produced nuts. So what was the evidence? What was the evidence that Aaron was the man God had chosen? It was very simple. There was life in his staff. The staff had sprouted and budded and blossomed and produced ripe almonds. Now that was something supernatural. The life in that staff had a divine origin. You could not explain Aaron's staff and what happened there by Aaron himself. You can only explain Aaron's staff by God. All 11 other staffs could be explained because nothing happened to any one of them. Only with Aaron's staff did something happen. And that was supernatural. God did it. Now, what's the lesson? The lesson is this. When God calls, God does it. When God calls, He does it. To accomplish His work in the world, as I told you earlier, God is not looking for volunteers. He's looking for those who are willing to make themselves totally available with no strings attached to obey instructions, to implement His plans, his commands and to carry out his instructions. Dear friends, please understand, God is committed only to his own program. We appoint all kinds of committees. We draw up plans. We devise all kinds of gimmicks and strategy. And then we pray and ask God to bless what we have come up with. And when we pray, we're trying to convince God that our plan is a good one. And we want God to endorse what we have done. God's not committed 
to any program but his own. He's not committed to yours, not committed to mine. Now, we may have great plans. We may have noble plans and very impressive plans. Now, Korah and his friends may have volunteered to fulfill the priesthood. And humanly speaking, they might have been just as capable and qualified as anybody. Truly. But God was totally unimpressed. God is not committed to our enthusiasm. He's committed only to our obedience. You understand that? You might have noble aspirations good plans you might be dedicated and devoted and very enthusiastic but what God wants is not your enthusiasm he wants your obedience God doesn't want volunteers at all that's not the criteria he doesn't want our volunteerism. He wants our availability. He wants our willingness to do anything, to go anywhere, to pay any price that God's will may be done and His interest further and to call people to present themselves, their bodies, as a living sacrifice. But I want to tell you something. To engage in any work for God on my own initiative or simply because I feel like well I just want to do my part without any concern for his will and for his purpose is not only foolish it's sinful the prophet Azariah once made an interesting statement to Asa king of Judah listen to this 2nd Chronicles chapter 15 12 uh, 15 2 2 Chronicles 15 2 the Lord is with you when you are with him interesting isn't it the Lord is with you when you are with him so how can I know that God is with me very simple by making certain I'm with him to ask God to be with me is a totally redundant prayer oh how often we pray and we ask God to be with us in this or that situation don't we do that oh God be with me we do not need to ask God to be with us we need to make certain we are with him because when we're with him we know he's with us our prayer needs to be Lord help me to be with you today and if I make it my business to be with him he'll make it his business to be with me now Jesus said something very similar listen to the word of Jesus in John chapter 12 verse 26 Jesus said where I am my servant also will be now don't reverse that don't reverse it and say where his servant is there Jesus will be the pace is not set by the servant but by the Lord Jesus gave a promise surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age now that promise was given of course in the context of his final and great commission to the disciples immediately before his ascension if they act under his authority if they implement his program of making disciples of all nations then I'm with you always now of course Jesus is always with us in the sense of being omnipresent in that sense we ask with David where can I go from your spirit where can I flee from your presence he's always with us of course the promise of presence 
with his obedient disciples speaks of presence in power and authority and his mighty working. But there's more at stake here than simply his presence. It's the fact, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. What matters is not what we do for God, but what we allow Him to do through us. What matters is not how much work and effort I exert in working for God. What matters is what I allow Him to do in and through me. So this is not to do with ability. God doesn't call us to go out and do a job for Him, but to, do, but to be a channel through which He can do His work through us. Now, the reason Aaron's staff budded and blossomed and bore fruit is simply this. Having called, God would take responsibility for the work. God was committed to no other staff in that tabernacle. Have you thought of that? What God did for Aaron's staff, he could have done on any other. But he didn't do it. God was committed to no other staff in the tabernacle. Why? Because no other staff was there by his appointment. If any other man took the role of priest, he might have been motivated. He might have been enthusiastic. He might have been well qualified. But God had no commitment to work through that man. In other words, Aaron was God's choice. And it was through Aaron that he would work. Now that does not mean that God is committed only to a select few people. And if you happen to be one of those, that's great. If you are not one of them, that's tough. No, God is committed to every one of us because He has plans for every one of us. You see, God's strategy doesn't leave any one of us out. God's strategy includes every single individual every one of his children and without exception it's through every one of us that he will work but dear friends we must make certain that we are in that place where he has strategized where he has appointed the apostle Paul describes the church as being the body of Christ Christ is the head Every true Christian is a member of that body with no exceptions. But Paul makes two basic statements. Two basic statements about the body that every Christian needs to appreciate. He says we are different because we all have differing functions and differing abilities. But he also said we are dependent. For nobody should operate in isolation or independence let's look at those two things first he said we're all different first Corinthians chapter 12 verses 4 through 6 there are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit there are different kinds of service but the same Lord there are different kinds of working but the same God works all of them in all men so for that reason I must never try to be somebody else. Or worse than that, I shouldn't insist that others should be just like me. God has made us different. And He's called us all to different functions. Now there are a lot of, a lot of Christians say, well, if I could preach like the pastor, it'd be different. Oh, if I could sing like sister so-and-so. If I could play a musical instrument, if I could be like that, God doesn't expect you to be like that person. 
God hasn't appointed you for that. God has an individual plan for you in the body of Christ. Now Paul illustrates this. He says the foot should never say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. And the eye should never say, because I'm not an uh, the ear should never say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 18, here's what Paul says. God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now let's just imagine the human body. Can you imagine the foot looking up at the hand? Here's the hand out here in fresh air. Here's the hand performing tasks. Here's the hand touching people. You meet somebody, you shake hands. He doesn't shake your foot. I mean, the hand has much greater dignity than the foot. You get up in the morning, what, ha what do you do with your foot? You stuff it into a sock. Nobody sees your foot all day long. And the hand is out there in the open. And as I said, people shake the hand. They kiss the hand. They don't kiss your foot. We put rings on the finger. Very rarely do we put rings on the toes. So you think about it. The foot has a reason to complain, doesn't it? The foot's not as important. It's, it, it's different. Different from the hand, and so the foot is inferior to the hand. Now the ear can say the same thing about the eye. You meet somebody. You talk to somebody. People look you in the eye. They don't look you in the ear. People, people comment on the color of your eyes. But they never talk about the color of your ears. And if they do, they're normally being rude. So the ear could easily think that it's inferior. So the body is made up of many different parts. And God engineered it that way. And he made every part important for its own function. Now why does Paul say all that? Simply for this. He states that there are many different roles and gifts that God has ordained within his body, the church. Now it's true that some roles may have a higher profile than others. There are some people who have a very important role in the function of the body of Christ. You never see them on the stage. In fact, you may not even know they exist. But it's not right to conclude that Others may be more important and more significant. All right. A second thing that Paul says here, we're all dependent. Although we're different, we're dependent. He, Paul says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Every part of the body needs every other part. Jesus, listen. Jesus Christ is not only working through individuals, He's working through His church as a corporate whole. Individuals make up the church. But it's the body we have been baptized into by the Holy Spirit. And it's as a body that He works. Each member is mutually dependent upon the other. I want to tell you, there is no such thing as lone wolf Christianity. Or maybe I should say lone sheep Christianity. No lone ranger mentality in the work of God. Aaron was not a lone ranger. Now he had a lone function. And the issue at stake with the staff of Moses, uh, of Aaron, 
was not whether God had work for the other tribes to do or the other members of the tribe of Levi who had not been given the privilege of priesthood but whether they were all equally qualified to do the work that God had given Aaron to do. No, they were not. Because God had other work for them to do. I hope you understand what I'm... This is not to discourage you. This is to encourage you. To show you that you have a function, a role, and don't envy those who are up here on the stage and say, hey, I'm not as important. It's true that in the work of God, some people have a higher profile than others. Aaron's priesthood was a case in point. Maybe, maybe Aaron's role, well, maybe it was more important. Maybe it would pay more rewards or get more rewards on the day of judgment you know as I travel sometimes I get the feeling that some Christians think themselves inferior to others and more sadly there are others who are tempted to think that they are far superior to others neither one is true neither one because Paul said to the Corinthian church you remember in 1 Corinthians I think chapter 3 the Corinthian church was guilty of exalting some over others and playing favorites and particularly here's Paul and, uh, and Apollos. Paul said, this is not the way. He said, what are you doing? He said, what is Apollos? What is Paul? He used the neuter pronoun. What thing? What do you think we are? We're only servants through whom you came to believe. And the Lord has done what? The Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos came along and watered it. But all along, who caused it to grow? God caused it to grow. Now look, if Paul had never planted the seed, there would have been no harvest. If Apollos had not come along and watered what Paul had sown, there would still have been no, no crop. But all along, neither one could take credit because it's God who gave the increase. So Paul said, he who plants and he who waters, why well, we're nothing. It's only God who makes things grow. So the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. So dear friends, don't measure yourself by somebody else. Do not measure your work, its quality, its importance by somebody else. Listen, if you're chained to the chariot of Christ and if you're fulfilling the function that God has for you, that's all that God demands. Obedience is all he wants from you. Somebody says, why? Well, I never see any effect. I never see any evidence of success. I don't see any visible evidence of God's fruit in my work. I want to encourage you, and I have some good news for you. First, let me exhort you. Don't be, don't be unduly discouraged if you don't see much evidence of fruit from that which relates directly to your obedience to God. It's not the apparent fruit that is of prime concern. I want to tell you what your concern is. Not the fruit. It's the root. 
It's the root from which the fruit derives that must be your concern. If the root is right and you're living in dependency upon Christ, then the fruit will look after itself. Whether it's visible to you or not. Did you know the root of an apple tree never sees the fruit? Doesn't even know it's there. Never sees it. But that is not the concern. The root's concern is what? To fulfill its function, the fruit takes care of itself. Oh, dear friends, you may never see the fruit of your work. You may never see it. But that's not your concern. Your concern is fulfilling God's appointed place for you. He takes care of the fruit. The fact that, listen, I tell you this, the root is more important than the fruit. Believe that. The fact that God has called you and is therefore using you will be expressed ultimately in fruit. The sprouting, the budding, the blossom, blossoming and, and, and the, uh, the almonds. Now we can be confident of that even when the fruit is not as fully evident as we'd like for it to be. Now I want you to notice something. Go back to Aaron's rod. I want you to notice that on Aaron's staff at each stage of the process that leads to mature fruit. Now some parts were just beginning to sprout. Some had formed into buds. Others were in full blossom. And yet others had already ripened into nuts. From some people's lives will come the sprouting. That's the initial evidence of life. So that from others may come the budding. And from others the blossoms. Until finally the full effect comes into being and there's the fruit. Paul said, I planted Apollos water. The man who plants, the man who waters have one purpose. And each will be rewarded according to his own labor. Each is different. But each is dependent. Now. The point that I emphasize to you right now is this. Whatever God has called you to do, rest assured there will be fruit that will please God. You may not be able to measure it. <clears throat> you may not be able, able to compile any statistics on the result of your work. But you can rest your head on the pillow every night and know that God has been at work. Don't try to measure the value of your work or the significance of your work by its apparent results, but by its cause. If you do what you do because God put you there, then you can afford to go for 40 years like Jeremiah and not see any tangible evidence of success. You understand? If you do what you do because you know God put you there, you may not see anything, but you know, like Jeremiah, it's not how people respond to what you say, but the origin of what you say that's important. Jeremiah complained to God. I don't know what to say, Jeremiah said. This is Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. The Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. And then Jeremiah knew. He knew that people didn't have to respond in order for him to know that he had done what's right. The people didn't respond. And Jeremiah, human as he was, became a discouraged man. <clears throat> he even died discouraged. But you know what? 
more than 2,500 years later, we are still benefiting today from the words of Jeremiah. And through his obedience, we still hear God speak to us. This is the fruit. And Jeremiah could be sure of it, not by measuring the immediate results of his ministry, but in the cause from which his ministry sprang. So your question is not what's happening as a result of my ministry. Your question is, is this God's place for me? See, other men wanted Aaron's ministry. You put a staff in their hands, they might be able to use it impressively. But take the man away from the staff, and the staff is lifeless and fruitless. Take Aaron away from his staff, put him to bed for a good night's sleep, and in the morning, that staff is sprouted and budded and blossomed and produced fruit. It's alive with supernatural life. You take a man God has called and remove him from his ministry and it will continue to bear fruit. You take a man that God has not called and put him in the ministry and everything that happens will be related only to his own ability. Take him away, the work dies with him. Take him away and the work collapses in a dead heap. You see, only the life of God can perpetuate the work of God. So, I want to leave you with a question here and I, I, I have to wait for another session to answer that question and I think this can be a, a, a sequel to what I'm trying to say to you question is this you ever wonder where did Aaron get his staff how do you get a life and ministry that lives and bears fruit the answer to that question is vital to our spiritual health and our well-being. And uh, I want to answer that question for you in another session. <laughs>